Hey guys, I'm your host Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to another episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Before we get started this week, I have a quick announcement. My latest book, Sumikowa, The Haunting of Higambana Heights, is now on sale. This is a collection of short stories all set within the same haunted building that are based on existing Japanese urban legends, ghost stories, and creepypastas, but all with their own unique twist. I've been hard at work on this book for a while now, so I hope you'll check it out and, even more so, I hope you'll enjoy it. You can find the link to that on koabana.net or in this week's episode description. This week, we have a special story which I'm able to bring you thanks to our amazing patrons. This was a big one and I've been working on it for quite some time now. This story was shared on Nichan way back in May of 2002, only a few years after the forums first began. Over the years it became a classic and even today many counted amongst their favourite stories to have ever come out of the forums. Considering that this story came out in 2002, a time when most stories were short enough to fit on your hand, this one is absolutely massive. Stories of this length generally didn't start becoming popular until nearly a decade later, so this one was a bit of a trailblazer. While working on it, it somewhat gave me some Fatal Frame vibes, particularly the first game set in the mansion, which came out only six months prior to this story being posted. But it's certainly no Fatal Frame clone. It's very much its own thing. Anyway, let's dive right into this week's story. This one's called The Annoying Wayside Grass. June, seven years ago, at about 10 pm, the phone in my house rang. It was an even more startling sound than usual. It was from Babakun, a musician. Apparently something awfully strange had happened that he couldn't explain over the phone. Even though it was late at night, he wanted me to come over and see for myself. He had just moved into a boarding house close to Kawagoe in Tokyo with the rest of his band. I felt an unwelcome tension in his unusually strained voice and We'd been friends for a long time, so I agreed to go over. Right as I was about to leave the house, someone suddenly knocked on the door in front of me. When I opened it, my friend Kayano-kun was standing there with a bottle of shochu. I told him that Baba-kun had asked me to go over and, because they also knew each other, he thought I shouldn't go alone and tagged along with me. We got in the car and chatted on the way. Apparently, Kayano-kun was bored and suddenly wanted to see my face. He was a pretty sharp-minded guy, so the moment he saw me, he knew something was going on. Baba-kun knew all sorts of people, so for a long time he was the type of person who easily got wrapped up in various sorts of trouble. Kayano-kun had heard of his turbulent history through me, but he felt like this time it was something different just like I did. After we'd been driving for about 30 minutes, Kayano-kun suddenly jumped. Ugh! Apparently, he'd seen a bright red figure of Neo, about 50 centimeters in height, standing in the middle of the road and making a don't come this way pose. He didn't know a lot about Buddhism at the time, so he called the figure Neo, but after looking at photos a few days later, Apparently, it actually looked a lot more like Fudo Myo. It was the first time I'd been to Babakun's house, so he met us at the nearest station. He got in the car, and as we drove over, we asked him what was going on. It was a nice, cheap, two story house, or so I thought. But something about it is strange. Anyway, just come over. Let me know what you think once you see it, he said. When we arrived, a highway ran right in front of us, and the house was one of ten ready-made lots with trees surrounding the other three sides. The open side faced the highway, 
and it had been built about 10 years earlier. As soon as we got out of the car, I turned my camera towards the house and took a picture. It was the middle of the rainy season, so it was a humid night. You sure messed up. I gave him my honest thoughts as we stood there. Let me tell you about my points of concern from the outside. The entire yard was covered in weeds, growing outward. In the southwest corner of the yard grew three trees that were about as high as the second floor. The tree furthest south of those three was withered and dying. And even though all of the houses on the street had apparently been built at the same time, this one alone was badly damaged and decaying. The neighbours watched us through their screen door as we went inside. It's a bit dirty, but come in, Babakun said as he stepped inside. Oh my god, what is that smell? Was the first thing I thought as we went in. Maybe they have a cat, Kayano-kun said. I nodded in agreement, but then Babakun said, No, we don't have a cat. But there are a few around here. Does it smell? It does, doesn't it? Ugh, no matter how much we clean this place, it always smells. After passing through the front door, there were stairs to the left. The door faced the west and a hall extended to the east. On the right at the end was the dining room and kitchen, the southeast, while on the left, the northeast was the bathroom. We went upstairs to the band's practice room, which was in the southwest. It was a bit chilly. No, it was more than chilly. It was freezing. The air conditioner? No, they didn't have one. And the window? Was closed. Outside it, something stood out that withered tree. This is the best room on the first floor, Babakun started to speak as the band's manager put out some tea for us. In short, he said, if people fell asleep on the first floor, they usually had nightmares. When everyone was on the second floor, they could hear voices chatting on the first. They could hear footsteps coming up the stairs from the first floor, but Nobody ever appeared. And when they moved into the house, they found a golf club case in one of the closets that had been left behind. And nobody liked going into the kitchen. Then he told us about the cats. Yesterday, I was on the second floor when I heard something downstairs. Maybe the guys who went shopping are back, I thought and went down to see them. When I got there, the front door was open, but nobody was home. Looking closer, one of the cats from the neighbourhood was inside, but no matter what, I couldn't catch the thing. As soon as I did, he'd struggle and scratch me and he'd get away again. Look at these wounds. So then, I opened the window for him. I chased him, but he ignored it. Then, at some point, he ran for the front door. Ah, oh, finally, I thought. But then he started acting strange. Right as he was about to step outside, he froze and turned on the spot. Then he ran through my legs and up the stairs, out an open window and onto the roof. But his behaviour at the door was really weird. It was honestly like... He'd seen something terrifying right in front of him, and so he turned back. Something much scarier than me when I'd been chasing him. Maybe something is manipulating the cat, Kayano-kun said in response. As they spoke, I sensed what seemed to be cats coming and going down the hall. Maybe the cat was just a coincidence. But it seems like there are other cats hanging around here that aren't alive, huh? I said. As I thought, 
Kayano-kun instantly agreed with me. Yeah, I saw the shadow of one pass down the hallway just now. Kayano-kun's comment was what was important. I'd said that about the cats to specifically get his opinion. But they're not real cats, are they? Do you want to check out the kitchen? I asked. No, let's leave that be for now. I have tomorrow off, so we should come back when it's bright. We spoke to Baba-kun for a little more after that, and he let us hear the demo of his band's new song, and we left around 2am, without once stepping foot in the kitchen. After seeing Kayano-kun off, I went home. Something felt wrong. I could sense someone in my younger brother's empty room. I turned the lights on and peeked inside, yet nobody was there. So it was here, huh? Go away, I screamed, and once the presence was gone, I hit the sack. First thing in the morning, I put my film in to be developed. They would be ready that evening, so I made my way to work. When I got there, there was a message waiting from my brother, Daisuke. I'll be home tonight. I'm going to invite some friends over. Buy some sake for me, please. My brother worked far away, so most of the time he lived in the work lodgings, and he returned home about once a month. I picked up the finished photos on my way home from work. First, I checked the negatives for any strange lights or damage, and then I carefully checked over the photos themselves. The withered tree really stood out in several photos, and something about it felt real creepy. But then, looking closer, I found a small red light, kind of like a mini light bulb, by the concrete block fence in the southwest corner. It wasn't in any other photos from the same angle, it was just in that one shot. It was also in the negative, so it was hard to imagine it was a developing mistake. Red. That usually meant bad energy. A small light. A strong spirit. I already knew what it was from the colour. No doubt about it. A curse. Right when I finished looking at the photos, Daisuke showed up with his friend, Enomoto-kun. What were you taking photos of? He asked as I cleaned the photos off the table. Ghosts. Huh. Where? Show me. A house? A haunted house? Enomoto-kun watched us and then joined in. Can I see too? As he was flicking through the photos, Daisuke told me all about him. He was a friend from his school days in the kendo club. Apparently, he could also see ghosts, and because of that, he worked part-time in a Mikkyo sect temple. And he was, apparently, quite eccentric. This red light here. This is a punishment from the gods, he said. He was good. I don't want to say anything careless, but do you mind if I take this for a few days? I'd like to discuss it with the master. For me, it won't cost a thing, so... I had the negatives, so I could give Kayano-kun a reprint. I handed that photo and a few others to Enomoto-kun. He ended up drinking late into the night with my brother, and then returned home the following day. Daisuke was interested in Baba-kun's house, however, so the next morning, he came up to me. You're going over there today with Kayano-san, right? I've got tomorrow off, so take me along too, please. It's dangerous. Something might follow you back, you know. Maybe it's because I do martial arts, but I'm totally fine with that. Kayano-kun appeared at midday, as planned, and the three of us made our way towards the house. That cat had constantly been on my mind, so I bought a bag of fish flakes on the way over as well. 
We arrived at the house right as the band was in the middle of practice. They said they'd be finished soon, so while we waited, we took another look around the area. They appeared to have cut down a forest to build the new lots, but there were also some old farmhouses dotting the area nearby. They didn't have to cut down the trees when there's already farmland nearby, I said. I was beginning to see how all of this had come together. We walked for a little while longer and then I noticed something. Hmm? Is that water? I could sense a pond or a well, something with stagnant water nearby. I couldn't place exactly where it was, but it was somewhere nearby. When we returned to the house, it had fallen quiet, and a woman, Fnaisan, came out to see us. After entering the house again, I took two unused plates, filling one with water and the other with the fish flakes I'd bought. I placed them both at the bottom of the stairs, the place where I could sense the cats most of all. Then I knelt down and put my hands together. Please don't stay here. Please move on, I prayed. About five minutes later, we were drinking tea in the practice room when I heard a meow coming from the hall. Is there another cat? Maybe they're after the fish flakes, Babakun said and stood up to check the hall. Huh. There's nothing there. You heard it too, right? He tilted his head in confusion, but the conversation soon continued as though nothing had happened. After that, I could no longer sense any cats in the house. But that little service for the cats seemed to egg on the real problem in the house. The three of us went into the kitchen, it was a combined dining room and kitchen about six tatami mats large. Nobody ate there, however, so there was no furniture, and thus looked rather spacious. First, I started taking photos. Huh. What's that? Some paper had peeled from the top of a nearby pillar. It wasn't clean, but rough, with some paper still left in the centre. It had turned yellow and looked rather old. It wasn't just there either. It was the same in all four corners of the room. Shinto charms. They'd been used to seal something. But now, they'd been torn off. I approached the one that had the most paper remaining to take a closer look. The middle of it was oddly black. A picture? A black dog. Mount Ontake? My legs are prickling. There's something here. I turned to Kayano-kun. Do you feel it too? My legs are prickling. Yeah, me too. Which area is the worst? The front, I think. Right. Again, we both agreed. Then Daisuke, who had been quiet until that point, finally spoke. Wow, something's out for blood. I closed my eyes and it felt like someone was approaching with a blade. Then my hip started to hurt, an old injury I had. Like it was poking at my weak point. It was exactly the same as when I went on a school trip to Sekigahara. Normally stuff like this didn't bother me, but this was something different. Something was there. I wouldn't be able to look for it while I was there. It was too dangerous. I'd have to do so later. We won't be able to treat this like the cat. It's impossible, I said, and I decided to tell Babakun to move house instead. Then I went to take a few more photos when Kayano-kun interrupted. I don't feel so good, so why don't we go over there and have some tea, he said, and we left the kitchen. Yeah, me too, Daisuke said and followed him.
so I left the room with them. When we returned to the practice room, Babakun was asleep. He said they were up all night writing their new score, Funai-san said, covering him in a light blanket. But he didn't seem to be sleeping peacefully. Before long, Babakun started to have a nightmare. For some reason, he muttered, Yeah, yeah. Huh? Looking at him closely, I could sense a presence. There was some type of shadow above him. What do you think? I asked Kayano-kun. Looks like sleep paralysis, don't you think? Something was holding him down? I believed Kayano-kun's guess was right on the money. Babakun has a strong will and carries out his intentions. He's strong when awake, but... So when he was tired, he was weak and something was taking advantage of that time to possess him. Shall we wake him up? Funai-san asked and shook his shoulders. But he didn't wake up, as usual. Ah, uh, hold on. If his consciousness doesn't come back, then things could turn out bad. He might not come back properly, so leave him be. I held Funai-san back from shaking him any harder. Huh? Something moved. Right above Babakun's back, Kayano-kun said suddenly. He moved his hand to about 30 centimeters above his back, and then quickly withdrew it with a gasp. Oh, that scared me. You give it a try too, he urged me on. What on earth could he see? Shit, it's affecting us too, I thought and copied Kayano-kun. I gently reached out with my hand. My hand went right through the moving shadow. But still, it didn't move. I gently pulled my hand back. The chill disappeared. It still didn't move. Cold, right? Kayano-kun said. There's no draft blowing through here, is there? So there was something in the house. Kayano-kun looked dead serious. Whatever was on top of Babakun, it still showed no signs of leaving. So I said a few words of exorcism. Whether it worked or not, the thing disappeared. No, it had withdrawn just for a moment. After that, we shook Babakun and he quickly woke up. Ah, oh, I'm so tired. Was I groaning in my sleep? He said, rubbing his eyes. You woke me up, right? I know you did. I just can't wake up from my dreams. This is the fourth time I've had that same dream. I don't have them on the second floor, but I have that same dream whenever I fall asleep here. Did I say something while I was asleep? You just said... Yeah, yeah, Funai-san said. Really? I thought I was shaking my head no. Do you want to hear what happened? And with that, Babakun started telling us about his dream. The gist of his dream was as follows. First thing I realized was that I was sitting in a tatami room. It was a big room, about 30 mats large. There were no lanterns and it was really old, kind of like a set from a period piece. Before long, a girl appeared. She was five or six maybe, really cute. She had a red long-sleeved kimono on, kind of like she was going to the 753 Children's Festival. Her hair was all done up nice too. If it really were a period piece, then she looked like she'd be the daughter of a samurai family. Will you play with me? She kept pestering me. I wanted to play with her, but it was like I couldn't move from that spot. If I did, then I was worried I wouldn't be able to return. Come play outside, she urged me again, not listening to me. Let's play, let's play, 
she said over and over. Fine, let's play here, I said, finally giving in, but she had apparently thought I'd say that and she smiled, bringing over some bean bags. Well then, what should we do, I thought as I took them from her. Then I heard a voice coming from the far end of the room. You're not allowed to play. It sounded like her mother. At that moment, the girl's smile disappeared. She turned pale and tried to hide behind me. She's calling you. You'll get in trouble if you don't go, I said. But the girl looked frightened and about to burst into tears. Then her mother finally appeared from the other side of the room. She was slim and wearing Japanese-style clothes. I couldn't tell from far away, but as she got closer, I could see that she was beautiful as well. She looks kind, I thought, but when I turned around, the girl was gone. Huh? Strange, I thought and turned around to look at the mother, but her previous expression had disappeared and she looked angry, like a demon. Fear washed over me. I've got to get out of here, I thought, and then I woke up. When he was done talking, two of his band members came down from upstairs. They were all about to head out for a performance meeting. We got up and got ready to leave ourselves when we heard someone running around on the roof. No, on the second floor. Everyone seemed to hear it, and for a moment, everyone stopped moving and looked at each other. Did you hear that? That's the second time, right? Nobody's upstairs right now, yeah? Baba Kun said, and the other guys nodded. If that was an adult, the footsteps would be heavier, Kayano Kun said immediately. It was a child. That was exactly the sound a child would make running around on the second floor. We all waited for something else to make a sound again, but that was the end of the footsteps. Everyone left the house and we hit the road back home. Once I got home, starting with the photos, I looked into the background of the house. That thing walking around on the first floor was an onryo, thousands of years old. I won't say what it is, as it may be tied to that land, but if it's able to leave, and if you happen to match wavelengths with it, it'll be dangerous. The evil spirit didn't seem to be from that plot of land, but rather it had attached itself to an unlucky family at some point, and ended up there. As the family died painful deaths, they created a strong barrier and ended up cursing that land all by themselves. The negative barrier was so strong that it attracted other things to it, and if it could capture them, it would. There were numerous wandering spirits in the photos I'd taken, victims themselves of the barrier. Amongst all that, there was a decisive battle. The owner at the time went nuts and did something terrible. While expanding the house, the owner tossed the protective statues on the property into the well. Putting aside whether people would do that now or not, there was no way someone in the past would have done such a thing. He had lost his mind. Then, after that, the well itself was buried. Enomoto-kun said that it might have been a punishment from the gods, and it was looking more and more likely that that was true. The first evil spirit functioned as the core of the barrier surrounding the place. But the statues in the well ended up turning into yet another strong nucleus, in essence, creating two black holes on the lot. The girl in question had been drawn in by both of these things and was a member of a newer family from several hundred years ago, I think. Her mother had been done in by an evil spirit and it hadn't been a kind death. She got sick and died elsewhere, but her desires remained on the lot. 
And as for the cat, it was a cat that the little girl had loved. At any rate, this wasn't something that could be cleared up with a purification ritual. They had to move out of there as soon as possible. I called Babakun right away and told him as much. However, he told me they'd used up all of their money to move in, so they were unable to move out so soon. They were also fed up with all the strange things going on in the house, but they thought that if they could just have the place purified, which was what led to them calling me in. I can't, I told him. I see. I thought so, he replied. He said he'd do his best to save money from his part-time job and promised he would move as soon as possible. Two months later, they were finally able to move, but they lost quite a bit during that time. Thanks to both the ghostly interference and each other. And of course, we weren't free from the ghostly damage either. The following night, Enomoto-kun called me. I went to work after we visited that house, and the moment the master saw my face, he screamed in a harsh tone. Where did you go? He took me to the main temple building and told me to sit. He was going to perform a purification because it's a little difficult to see your own back. So he performed an exorcism. It's not uncommon for wandering ghosts to attach themselves to you, but they usually drop off once we enter the temple grounds. For him to go ahead and perform a purification like that was really rare. You've gotten yourself involved in something truly dangerous, he then said and told me to stop whatever I was doing. I gave him the photos you gave me and told him what I knew. According to him, the Jizo statue was thrown away and buried without a service being performed for it first. There was a water vein somewhere down there and the statue was covered in mud. Because of that, the gods had sent punishment down upon that land, and that lot turned into a dwelling for evil spirits. He also said that people had been murdered there, and the effects of that were fearsome. The evil spirits would attack the moment someone slipped out of consciousness. And charms had been hung in one of the rooms, but they had no effect. If one put their life on the line to battle the evil spirits, they might be able to do something about it, but there was nothing that could be done about the divine punishment. Those who had gotten involved in the lot over the years had lost their lives, and he said that if he was asked to visit there himself, he would refuse. Purifying people of the spirits that attached themselves to them there, in other words, exorcisms, were possible. But purifying the spirits themselves would be extremely difficult. And purifying the land itself would be a job like no other. He said all we can do is leave it alone. Let sleeping dogs lie. If they don't get away from that lot as soon as possible, it'll be a matter of life and death. That place is impossible to cleanse even for the numerous famous shamans around the country right now. It might be possible if people were ready to dig up and prepare the soil in the entire region, but nevertheless, there's no merit in putting one's life on the line to purify that place right now. Plus, the reason the land is how it is can be traced back to Japan's prehistory. Of course, there's no reason to look that up now. He says there are spots like this all over Japan. Be careful. Even so, there has to be a reason as to why you were pulled into that lot. It's fine for an outsider to think about why, but for someone directly involved, meaning someone living there, that could invite death. If you remain unaware of fate, you could once again be drawn into something elsewhere. And when they move, he said to cover all their furniture in salt and have everything purified as soon as possible. So, as long as nobody died, it would be better for me not to get involved. 
and Omoto-kun also told me some of his own thoughts, which I then conveyed to Kayano-kun. We then agreed not to go back near that place again. And yet, only a week after the problem had first arisen, we found ourselves back at that house again. But putting that aside for the moment, the negative influence of that lot continued for a short while after. This happened most frequently in my younger brother's room, at home. I could sense a presence in there, even though the room was empty. I could occasionally hear voices whispering to each other. They had to be wandering ghosts from that place. Leave! I turned the lights on and prayed, and they soon disappeared. This continued once or twice a week. And while I was praying, I often felt something standing behind me. Something that caused me to break out in goosebumps all over. This wasn't the chief evil spirit, but rather a subordinate. I continued praying fervently, and before long, it would disappear too. I had only asked the spirits to return, so it wasn't exactly an exorcism. Dealing with these sorts of spirits was fine, but if I stuck my nose in, then they would start appearing one after the other, eventually leading to the head ghost. Trying to purify them would just make matters worse. These negative effects even extended to Kayano-kun. Apparently, he started drifting off on his way home from work, and then suddenly, he felt as though he was sitting on a tatami mat. A bad feeling washed over him, and he looked around and realized he was in the tatami room from Babakun's dream. That little girl appeared before him, and in his mind he expected the terrifying mother wouldn't be too far behind either. But he couldn't sense her. He realized it was a dream and he had to wake up. But while he was thinking of it, he finally heard those footsteps approaching from the other side of the room. It had to be the mother with the face like a demon. He felt indescribable terror, and yet, it wasn't her. At that point, he didn't know whether it was the head spirit or not, but either way, he saw it. It gradually got closer and closer. He got so scared that he screamed and prayed for help. Kami! Buddha! Grandpa! Ah! His prayer seemed to go through in the nick of time. He was able to wake from the dream. Kayanokun called me immediately after. His description of the spirit was all too real in my head. I'll spare you from the details though, please understand. That was the head spirit, I told him. Huh? The guy that cuts people? Are you serious? For a moment he was at a loss for words. Thankfully, that was the only time he ever had that dream. Putting together my thoughts and Kayano-kun's description, it was terrifying. Even now I still don't want to think about it. Honestly, I hate even writing about it. My own health was affected as well. My shoulders felt oddly heavy, and the tips of my fingers went numb as well. Of course, those invisible guests were the cause of it all. Normally, I'd be able to shake them off whenever they tried to latch onto me, but as I dozed from exhaustion in the train on the way home from work, they'd find their way to me and jump on. They were all the same type of wandering ghosts, so getting rid of them was easy enough. But that didn't negate the fact that, until I was able to, they made me feel sick, and my shoulders go real stiff. They were a nuisance. The stiff shoulders were just the start of it. They were hoping for my health to fail, and so I became extremely sensitive about maintaining it. And on top of that, it had been a long time since I last experienced sleep paralysis, but 
After visiting that house, I experienced it another two or three times. As for my brother Daisuke, the pain from his hip that he injured long ago flared up again. It was the first time in over 10 years. It was a pre-existing injury, but they got in there and made it hurt again. Poking at one's weaknesses were what they were good at. It hurts, he complained, lying face down. When I checked it out, only that lower region of his back was absorbing heat. I cleansed him of his guests and urged the energy to flow again, which saw the pain disappear. It started hurting again a few days later, so he returned home and I fixed it again. In other words, this happened over and over, fixing his pain and then the pain coming back again. This continued until we finally cut all ties with that plot of land. Nevertheless, thanks to that, he came to clearly understand his ties and weaknesses. Afterwards, he became very humble in the way he thought about everything. So, about Kayano-kun. Considering he'd had the scariest experience, he seemed to be affected the least by everything going on. His shoulders felt a little stiff and he had a stuffy nose. That was it. He was protected by a strong, powerful force. Then, we got the final call. This was a week after we went to visit the house for the second time. When Kayano-kun dropped by my place, Daisuke was also home with Enomoto-kun. We all gathered around Enomoto-kun to start our special meeting on how to deal with that haunted house. In the end, it was decided that once we had separated ourselves from its influence, we would cleanse our surroundings. The very moment we decided not to get involved any longer, we got the call. It was Babakun. Things are getting worse. Can you please come over? He asked. The unrest in the house had gotten so bad that the band was on the verge of breaking up. Of course, I had every intention of refusing him, but he was so insistent. I couldn't. Kayano-kun and I decided to go back together. Daisuke and Enomoto-kun stayed back and readied themselves. Enomoto-kun warned us as we were leaving. If you end up seeing a certain thing, you'll be in great danger. But it's something easy to misjudge or mistake, so I can't say what it is out loud. Simply saying it would be dangerous. If you go there without knowing what it is and then you see it, you'll likely recognize it right away. It doesn't move, so be careful. Oh yeah, I have a charm that works real well. Here, take it. I had no idea what this thing he was talking about was. Kayano-kun took the charm and I took a shower to focus my energies, and then around 9pm, we set out. It's like that land is calling us. Hey, come over, come over, waving its hand at us, Kayano-kun said. It's probably possessed Babakun as well, and it's using him as a pawn to get us back. The thing we had to pay most attention to, perhaps the most dangerous thing of all, was driving in the car on the way to and from that land. An accident was the easiest and quickest way to get rid of us. With that in mind, I concentrated on driving over there as safely as possible. Kayano-kun sat in the passenger's seat with a serious expression on his face. Every now and then he gave some advice and he paid close attention to everything, as though he were the one driving the car. I grew more nervous as we got closer to Babakun's house. Kayano-kun seemed to feel the same. To borrow his words, it's like sneaking deep into an enemy camp. If it were a movie, it would be exciting, but... But it wasn't. The same chills ran down my spine, but my nerves were on fire. They crackled with energy. The goosebumps all over my body refused to go away. 
When we were about two or three minutes away, the road suddenly ended. Closed. We had to go around because they were doing construction work. Construction. On today, of all days, Kayano kun complained. But even at times like this, things would find a way to hinder us. It says we can go around in a U-shape. Be careful. I turned to the right, as the arrow ahead indicated. I followed the path and reached an intersection. I turned left, like the map on the sign indicated. I turned left again, and the road we were on should have taken us back to where we needed to be. After driving about 300 meters, the paved road ended and we hit a gravel road. Huh? That's no good. I was on full alert, but before long, we were back on the paved road again. Relieved, I looked ahead. There was a white car stopped on the side of the road. Something felt wrong, so I slowed down as we approached. The bad feeling got even worse. Something's different. We should go back, I said, and Kayanokun agreed. The road was too small to turn around, so we looked for somewhere I could do a U-turn. There seemed to be an open space past that white car. I continued driving forward, and we were about four or five meters from the car. The headlights shone on it. It appeared to be empty, abandoned. The windscreen was smashed and the car itself covered in ivy. A cold chill ran down my spine. That's it! It wasn't something we should be near. I slammed on the brakes. <gasps> no way! Stop the car! Go back! Kayanokun screamed. He felt the exact same as me. I'm gonna reverse back. Watch that side of the road for me. I started reversing the car, and we passed over the gravel road. The road widened once we reached the paved area again, so I was somehow able to turn the car back around. As we returned the way we came, we stumbled upon another detour. They hadn't finished paving the road, so we had mistaken it for an alley. Seemed we'd missed that sign earlier. As we were checking the road, a small local truck approached us from the dead end street. Then, it turned down that road. Let's follow it. After driving for about a minute, we ended up back on the original road and, before long, we could see Babakun's house. First thing we did when we got there was ask Babakun about that road. We drew a map and pointed out the abandoned car. Huh? That road would run into the highway though. Did you see the walls or anything? Although I've never been there before. But the roads in that area are surrounded by fields on both sides. If the side of the road were to collapse, you'd get stuck there. Babakun didn't know anything about it, but then his bandmate, Gotokun, interjected. There was a road past that abandoned car. I'd ridden down that road on my bike before, but past that car is a dead end. It's just a thicket. You can see it clearly in the day, but how strange. There's only about 10 meters of paved road near that car. No, not asphalt. More like concrete. Ah. Oh yeah. Was there an empty house nearby? It looks just like a haunted house. Ah oh, yeah, it's night. You wouldn't be able to tell. But yeah, it's not a very nice place. I wonder if there's a graveyard around there or something. I remembered what Enomoto-kun had said and grabbed the phone. Ah, Daisuke, put Enomoto-kun on. Enomoto-kun, was that thing you were talking about, by any chance, a car? Yeah, did you see one? What I saw was a white car stopped on the side of the road. There was this massive spiritual power coming from it. If you get too close, it'll probably snag you in it. But you soon understood what it was, right? Huh? 
You got that close to it? Damn, that was dangerous. If you get too close to it, your ability to see things will weaken or cloud, so be careful. I couldn't say what it was. If I said it was a white car, well, those are everywhere, and they all would have drawn your attention, meaning you could have looked right past it and that would have been even more dangerous, you know? Unfortunately, I don't know the truth behind that place with the car. I never had a chance to go and check it afterwards. Plus, I didn't want to check it either. But it undoubtedly had something to do with Babakun's house. I had intended to keep my mind strong so that I wouldn't suffer any spiritual damage, but it seemed the evil of the land was too much, and it had captured me again. After the rest of the band left to get dinner, Babakun started talking. The following is what happened during the week we hadn't been there. 1. When it had been raining three days earlier, lightning had struck somewhere nearby. Thanks to that, they lost their synthesizer and synchrosa data. The synthesizer especially was useless and they had to buy a new one. They were making do with a rental, but it was costing too much money, which was eating into their fund to move. Depending on how things went, they may have to cancel their upcoming live performance. 2. Hayamakun, their guitarist and arranger, had gotten another man's wife pregnant, and thanks to that, he'd lost all interest in music and his thoughts were elsewhere. Apparently, another band had been in contact with him as well. I had them show me the woman's photo, and there was something about it. Something strong. I borrowed a photo from them and took it back to Enomotokun later to show him. This woman's eyes. They're not human. She's being manipulated, he said. I later discovered that she worked for the company that introduced Babakun to the house. Maybe there was good money to be made in the finder's fee for that house with such a high turnover. 3. They couldn't sleep on the first floor, so they stopped having that dream. But when they slept on the second floor, they could feel something heavy sitting on their chests. It wasn't massively heavy, but when they woke up, the feeling disappeared. Maybe it was that child. 4. After laying out his futon, Babakun went downstairs to the toilet. But when he returned, his bed looked like somebody had slept in it. When he touched the sheets, they felt and smelt like dried sweat. 5. They heard footsteps going up and down the stairs at least twice. Both times, it happened at 2am. 6. When he was walking around the house, Babakun felt like something had grabbed his ankles, making it difficult to keep walking. As he spaced out, it felt like something had nailed his feet to the ground, and when he came back to, he was standing frozen on the spot. This had apparently happened numerous times to his bandmates as well. Look, your life depends on this, so first things first, you need to move out of this place, I said to Babakun right away. You're not going to be able to make music if you're dead. As long as you stay here, nothing is going to go right. The next time I see you will be when you go to get purified, alright? I drove the point home. I spent another 30 minutes talking to him about the move, and then left to go home. As we were leaving, I started chanting and praying again, about 10 minutes from the house. When I turned around, that old, withered tree swayed side to side. Not even two months had passed before they all ended up moving out. Or rather, they abandoned that house. They were still in debt, but at least they were alive. Still, the band itself broke up. Hayamakun joined another band, and Babakun and the bassist Gotokun started their own band. But there's still something that bothers me. Other than Hayamakun and that woman, I saw everyone else go to get purified. A 
Apparently those two went somewhere else, a shrine I heard, to be cleansed. I never heard anything from them again after that, so I don't know whether they were able to fully cut away from that house. Still, I hadn't heard any bad rumours either, so at the very least, they're probably still alive. The real question was how far she'd managed to get her claws into him though. Ever since all this went down, I now see wandering spirits all over the place. But I don't think most of them have anything to do with that house. If you focus on yourself, and not them, they're easy enough to get rid of. Maybe a better way of putting it would be, if you don't pay any attention to them, they go away. If you happen to be of weak disposition, I recommend getting a charm. But, I have a way of strengthening your spiritual powers. Chant the following words three times and pray. Gyati, Gyati, Hara Gyanti, Hara So Gyanti, Boji Soaka. While many enjoyed this story, some also felt that some of the ambiguity, particularly towards the end, could have been handled a little better. For example, it's never really specified who or even what the head ghost is. Some assumed that the white car at the end was the head ghost taking physical form, while others thought it was something randomly added that detracted from the story. There has been much debate about this story and what it all means over the years, but in the end, it's up to each person to decide for themselves what to take away from it. You can head over to the Koabana Discord if you'd like to chat about it with other fans, and you can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. And again, a big thank you to all our patrons for helping us reach our goal of getting this story translated. You guys rock. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin and get both early access and over 100 bonus episodes right now. But that's all for this week. Stay safe, guys, and I'll see you again next time for even more Koabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.